everybody that came out for Sunday school as well. Invite your friends and neighbors to be a part of Sunday school next week because this uh, challenge is going to continue till the end of the month. And I uh, want to encourage you to, uh, to help our Sunday school grow and invite folks to come be a part of that. Let's continue with our worship as um, Alan comes to leave. If it's a good thing or a bad thing that we won the feud, I don't know if I'm still thinking on that. I'm glad we had more in Sunday school, though. I ask you to stand as we sing our first song, hymn number 75, I Love Thee. I love thee, I love thee, I love thee, my Lord. I love thee, my Savior, I love thee, my God. I love thee, I love thee, and thus thou dost know. But how much I love thee, my actions will show. O oh, Jesus, my Savior, I didn't tell Braden, but let's do that second verse because it starts out, I'm happy, I'm happy. And I don't think you can sing that and not look happy. So if you want to pull out your hymn book real quick, I don't think we have that up there on the screen. It is verse number two. Oh, Braden's already got it. Man, he's the man with the plan. Good job. Verse number two. Here we go. I'm happy, I'm happy, oh, wondrous love.
coming down this morning let's sing our little chorus God is so good this morning God is so good God is so good oh let's start again let's just start again here we go from the beginning here we go God is so good, God is so good, God is so good, He's so good to me. Sing that again. God is so good, God is so good. God is so good. He's so good to me. Take a few moments and greet your neighbors this morning in the name of the Lord.
we sing? God is so good. God is so good. God is so good. good. Amen. And you may be seated. like to ask uh, everyone that would like to uh, join us at prayer time at the altar, you can come forward at this time. As we go to the Lord in prayer, we have uh, many things to uh, go to prayer about. Heavenly Father, we just thank you for the beautiful morning, first of all, that you've given us, Father, after we've come through the cold weather and the snow. Father, we just uh, are glad to feel the sunshine this morning, and we thank you for just one of the many, many blessings that you give us, Father. Father, we just ask this morning that you be with the David Patterson family as they uh, are going through a time of bereavement. Father, we just uh, uh, know that he is in a at, he is at home now, and he is no longer feeling feeling pain. Father, we just ask that you be with Tim, Pastor Tim, and Becky as they take on this new chapter in their life as be with them as keep them safe just uh, give them the uh, uh, spirit of uh, your precious Holy Spirit during this time that, that, that uh, the Holy Spirit may be just uh, guide and direct them in everything that they do father we just uh, we just thank you now and praise your name for the time that uh, that we've had them in our lives, Father, and what they've meant to our church. Heavenly Father, we just ask that you be with our church during this, this time of transition. Father, we just ask that you give us a, a, a clear mind of direction, Father, that we, we have a, a, a guidance, give us the, the guidance to know uh, where we're, know exactly where we're headed as a church, Father. Just give us a clear vision of that, and that, that you always be at the forefront of everything that we do, that we give you the glory, Father, that we just keep Jesus Christ in, in front of everything that, that we do at East Side, Father. Just give us, give us wisdom in our uh, choices that we make in the upcoming weeks and months, Father, and uh, that we might just uh, continue the rich heritage that this church has had under and guidance and direction of our Lord Jesus Christ, Father, as we go go forward, Father. Uh, Father, we ask that uh, you be with uh, Brother Doug as he leads, continues to lead the youth and young folks, Father. Be with Alan as he uh, uh, continues to be with the choir and uh, that ministry that's, that we enjoy and that uh, is such a big part of our worship. Uh, on, on Sunday morning, Sunday evenings, and the times that we get to get to, to hear them and participate with them, Father. Father, is be with all phases, every ministry that our church has, Father. We just ask that you just continue just to lead, guide, and direct, and and all the many many folks that that continue to make Eastside the loving, compassionate, wonderful place it is under under your leadership, under your guidance, Father, that we continue to put Jesus Christ first in our church, Father. Father, we just thank you for all these blessings that you've given us, Father. We ask all these things in Christ's precious name. Amen. Our offertory hymn this morning is hymn number 76, My Jesus, I Love Thee. May we stand as we sing. My Jesus, I love Thee, I know Thou art mine. For Thee all the follies of sin I resign. My gracious Redeemer, my Savior,
Ushers to come forward, please. Make sure he's done over there. Because <laughs> if you just want to keep playing, that's great with me. <laughs> if you got your Bibles, let's turn with me to John chapter 5, verse 19. John chapter 5, beginning in verse 19 this morning. Last time we were together, we talked about the fact that Christ had healed a man by the pool of Bethesda who had been crippled for 38 years. And uh, he, is, he is an individual who, uh, who had no hope. Christ brings hope into the situation, and uh, the man picks up his bed, and he begins to walk away, and the religious leaders catch him carrying his bed, and they are upset about the fact that he is carrying his bed, and when they find out that Jesus healed the man on the Sabbath, they're upset about that as well, because they disapprove of anything being done on the Sabbath. And when they criticize Jesus for, for what he has done, he responds that both he and the Father are working. Even though it's the Sabbath, that they are still at work. And of course, he meant that God the Father, uh, the, uh, uh, God the Father who uh, he is one with, he knew that he is God, and the religious leaders are angry about this because Jesus is claiming a special relationship with the Father. He's claiming a special relationship with the Father. And, and he basically tells them, listen, if you don't like the fact that I heal people on the Sabbath, and you don't like the fact that I claim a special relationship with the Father, just wait a minute. I'm going to tell you some things you really aren't going to like. And that's what we're going to look at this morning as Jesus speaks and he continues to claim things uh, about himself that are absolutely going to send the religious leaders of his day into spasms of anger 
with him. In verse 19, what does Jesus say about himself? Then Jesus answered and said to them, Most assuredly, I say to you, the Son can do nothing of himself, but what he sees the Father do, for whatever he does, the Son also does in like manner. For the Father loves the Son and shows him all things that he himself does, and he will show him greater works than these that you may marvel. For as the Father raises the dead and gives life to them, even so the Son gives life to whom he will. For the Father judges no one, but has committed all judgment to the Son, that all should honor the Son just as they honor the Father. He who does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent him. Most assuredly I say to you, he who hears my word and believes in him who sent me has everlasting life and shall not come into judgment, but is passed from death into life. Most assuredly, I say to you, the hour is coming and now is when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God and those who hear will live. For as the Father has life in himself, so he has granted the Son to have life in himself and has given him authority to execute judgment also because he is the Son of Man. Do not marvel at this. For the hour is coming in which all who are in the graves will hear his voice and come forth. Those who have done good to the resurrection of life and those who have done evil to the resurrection of condemnation. I can of myself do nothing as I hear I judge and my judgment is righteous because I do not seek my own will but the will of the Father who sent me. May the Lord add his blessing to the reading of his word. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we ask that you would take your holy, inspired, and inerrant word and that you would use it to open our eyes so that we can see you for who you are, that you would draw our hearts even closer to you through the preaching of your word, and Lord, that you would lift our thoughts to heaven and help us to think of you as we ought to. Lord, make us better disciples of Christ for having heard your word this morning. Help us to glimpse the glory of Almighty God, to see you for who you are. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Now we have just come through the Christmas season and there is a temptation after coming through the Christmas season to kind of leave Jesus there in the manger. To, to leave him as a Christmas decoration, to leave him as a, a, a babe in a, in a manger, a, a decoration that we set out on the coffee table or we set out in, in the vestibule, uh, a non-threatening uh, babe that that is nice to talk about at the Christmas season, but really doesn't impact our lives after that. But Christ is much more. The testimony of the scriptures is that Christ is much more than just a Christmas decoration. He is much more than just the babe in the manger. The testimony of the scriptures is that Jesus Christ is the almighty God of the universe, the creator of all things, our redeemer, our Lord, our, our savior, our king, the king of kings, the Lord of lords. And in our scripture this morning, Jesus makes some astounding, some remarkable claims about himself. And I want to urge you to listen as we read the scripture this morning and note these things that Christ claims about himself. And the first thing he claims is that he is in perfect unity with God the Father. Look at verse 19 again. Then Jesus answered and said to them, Most assuredly, I say to you, the Son can do nothing of himself but what he sees the Father do. For whatever he does, the Son also does in like manner. For the Father loves the Son and shows him all things that he himself does. And he will show him greater works than these that you may marvel. Now, Jesus says here that he can do nothing whoop, of himself. He can do nothing of himself. Now, when he says that, he's not saying that he's somehow less than God. He is less than the Father. Rather, what he's saying is that he cannot do anything differently from the Father. And the reason is because they are one. They are one in will. Uh, they are one. They are the, the, he's speaking here of the, the mystery of the Trinity, where the Godhead is one being, but three persons. And as one being and three persons, God shares one will. So the will of the Father is the will of the Son. And the will of the Son is the will of the Spirit. And the will of the Spirit is the will of the Father and the Son. They share one will. So Christ is saying here, 
I can't do anything that is different from the will of the Father because I have the same will the Father does. I share His will. What He wills, I will. What, what the Father desires is what I desire. He's claiming here to be co-equal with the Father. And this really is a statement that he repeats over and over throughout the scriptures, especially here in John's gospel. In John chapter 10, verse 30, Jesus says, I and my Father are one. In John 14, verse 9, he says, If you have seen me, you have seen the Father. If you have heard me, you have heard the Father. If you have received me, you have received the Father. If you have rejected me, you have rejected the Father. I and the Father are one. That's essentially what he is saying to us here. Now imagine the religious leaders of that day who, who saw God very differently than we see God. Now understand in the Old Testament, uh, and, and the Old Testament was the scriptures that, that the religious leaders of Jesus' day had. In the Old Testament, God is a very distant being. God is an all-powerful being, especially when you go back to the, the law. God is treated almost like a, a radioactive source, like a, like a bomb that is about to go off, that you have to treat with, very, with kit gloves. If you don't do the right thing, you're incinerated. If you, don't, if you touch the wrong thing, you drop dead. Uh, God is not someone who is near to you. He is not someone that you enter into a, a close relationship with. And then Jesus comes along and he refers to God as his Father. He's claiming a different relationship with God than they've ever seen before. And not only that, he claims to, have, uh, to be one with the Father. If you've seen the Father, you've seen me. Can you imagine how the, the Pharisees, the scribes, the, the, the law lawyers of that day, how, can you imagine how they must have saw Jesus? How they would have reacted to that kind of talk, that kind of speech? You and the Father are one? You refer to him as your Father? You claim to have this personal relationship with him? They were amazed. And more than that, they were angered by it. They were upset that he would claim this kind of, of, of relationship with the Father. See, they understand what Jesus is saying about himself. They understand that he is claiming to be nothing less than God himself. God himself. Now, there are a lot of cults out there that, that don't believe that Jesus is God. And you really want to know whether a, a religious group is a cult or not, ask them what they believe about Jesus. Look at what they believe about Jesus, that'll tell you whether or not they're a cult. I had a, a couple of uh, Jehovah's Faults witnesses came around to my house not too long ago. And uh, Becky always laughs because I'm the only person she knows that gets excited when the Jehovah's Witnesses come around. Because you know, so, they, they come around and I'm like, oh, where's my Greek Testament? Let's go, let's go. So I, I go out there and I'm talking to them and... Uh, and I listen to the little spiel, and there's two of them. There's always one that's older and one that's kind of new to their, their religion. And so they put the little new guy out first, and he's talking to me. And afterwards, I, I said, well, uh, let, let's look at the Bible a little bit. I said, now, now, it says here in Genesis 1 that in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. That's right. And you don't believe Jesus is God. No, Jesus, they say, is created. He was a created being. I said, okay, so you don't believe Jesus is God? No, no, Okay. Let's turn over to Colossians 1.16. And Colossians 1, 16 through 18 says, By him, meaning Jesus, were all things created. Now, according to Genesis 1, who created all things? God. According to Colossians 1, 16, who created all things? Uh, they couldn't answer that. I said, I tell you what, let's turn over to John chapter 20, verse 28. In John 20, verse 28, the disciples had, had seen Jesus. Jesus appeared to them after he was resurrected, but Thomas wasn't there. And Thomas said, I won't believe unless I actually see him, put my hand in his side, my finger in the holes in his hand. I won't believe. Later on, the Bible says in John 20, 28, Jesus appears to them again, and this time Thomas is with them. And when Jesus appears to them, Thomas, the apostle, says, my Lord and my God. I'm standing there looking at these two guys, and the older one says, come on, let's move along. Let's just get out of here. Let's... <laughs> the Bible is very clear. Jesus is God. 
I and the Father are one. Jesus, in him, dwells the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Jesus is God. The Bible is not uh, uh, unclear on that. The Bible is not uh, kind of squishy on whether or not Jesus is God. It's very clear. Now, human beings, human beings, when we communicate, sometimes we're not real clear. We communicate, we don't get things very precise sometimes. I, I was reading Tom Rayner, who's head of Lifeway, came up with a list of his 10 favorite bloopers from church bulletins. And, and uh, he, he came up with this list. Uh, number 10 was, this is actually a, actually a pilgrim church bulletin. So at the end of the evening service tonight, or excuse me, at the evening service tonight, the sermon topic will be, what is hell? Come early to listen to our choir. Number nine, the pastor would appreciate it if the ladies of the congregation would lend him their electric girdles for the pancake breakfast. <laughs> Number eight, the pastor will preach his farewell message. This kind of resonates with me. The pastor will preach his farewell message, after which the choir will break into song, break forth into joy. <laughs> Number seven, Irving Benson and Jesse Carter were married on October 24th in the church. So ends a friendship that began in elementary school. <laughs> Number six, an announcement in the church bulletin about the National Prayer and Fasting Conference. The cost for attending the National Prayer and Fasting Conference includes meals, which I guess it would, wouldn't it? Number five, Charlene Mason saying, I will not pass this way again giving obvious pleasure to the entire congregation. Number four, next Sunday is the family hayride and bonfire at the Fowler's. Bring your own hot dogs and guns. Some of us would like that one. Number three, the church will host an evening of fine dining, superb entertainment, and gracious hostility. I think they meant hospitality there, but... Number two, for those, who have, uh, those of you who have children and don't know it, we have a nursery downstairs. Well, I, hope, I hope you know if you've got children. And then finally, his favorite, ladies, don't forget the yard sale. It's a chance to get rid of those things not worth keeping around the house. Don't forget your husband. <laughs> you know, we, we can be unclear in our communication. Sometimes we, we don't say exactly what we mean or it doesn't come across exactly the way we mean it. I read about a, a company just recently that uh, was uh, involved in a, in a uh, lawsuit. Evidently their uh, policy for, for overtime pay was not clear and, and uh, the lawyers looked at their policy and because they'd left one comma out, one comma, the company wound up paying ten million dollars in overtime and, and back pay because they left one comma out. You know, sometimes we're not very precise. We, we don't say exactly what we mean. Folks, the Bible is God's holy word. Every word in it is exactly what he meant to say, and God doesn't make mistakes. God has communicated very clearly who Jesus Christ is. He is God. He is God. Make no mistake about it, that is not an unclear thing in the Bible. The Bible is abundantly clear as to the identity of Christ. We need not fear that we have misunderstood who Jesus is because the Bible is about as unambiguous as it can possibly be. Jesus said, I and the Father are one. Jesus is God. And since he is God... He has certain uh, authority. For instance, he has the power to give life. Verse 21. For as the Father raises the dead and gives life to them, even so the Son gives life to whom he will. Now, eventually, as we read through the Scriptures, we're going to see that those who are following Jesus are going to see Jesus raise the dead. They're going to be there when he says, Lazarus, come forth, and Lazarus gets up, dead three days and walks out of the tomb. They're going to see him raise the dead physically. And he has the power to give physical life. But Jesus has the power to give more than physical life. 
In verse 24, it says, Most assuredly, I say to you, he who hears my word and believes him in him who sent me has everlasting life. Notice that is present tense. Those who, who, believe, who, uh, who believes in him and sent me has everlasting life. You have it if you believe. And shall not come into judgment, but has, has already, it's something that's already happened to you, has passed from death into life. Most assuredly, I say to you, the hour is coming and now is when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God and those who hear will live. For as the Father has life in himself, so he is granted to the Son to have life in him. He is talking here about spiritual life, eternal life life with him in heaven. If you are a believer in Jesus Christ, you already have, you already possess eternal life. Now you might die physically. In fact, most of us will probably will die physically unless Christ returns and we are raptured. And uh, you know, I, I, I wouldn't mind that happening in any moment, folks. But if the Lord tarries, all of us will die physically. But the Bible says that we believe in him. We believe in Jesus Christ. We have put our faith in him as our Savior who died on the cross to pay the penalty for our sins and we've trusted in him and him alone for our salvation. The Bible says you will never die physically, uh, sp spiritually. You may die physically, but you will never die spiritually. You have eternal life in Christ. If you know Christ as your Savior, you already possess eternal life. Christ has come to provide all that our souls need. And he perfectly suits the condition of our soul. He suits the desires of our soul, the needs of our soul, the wants of our soul, the longing of our soul. He is our soul's counsel, our support, our pardon, our delight, our fullness, our glory, our life, our power. He is all that we need. And everyone who hears his voice and responds to him in faith already possesses eternal life. It is a present fact in your life. You are in possession of eternal life. And who is it who has the power to grant that eternal life? It is Jesus Christ, the second person of the Trinity, the Son of the living God. Now the scribes and the Pharisees who are listening to all this uh, they thought that they would be rewarded by God for keeping the law. If they kept the Old Testament law, if they, they did their best to keep the Old Testament law, that God would reward them spiritually, that they would have eternal life. What the Bible teaches and what Christ is preaching here is that salvation, eternal life, uh, heaven and all of its rewards do not depend on you being good. They depend on belief. On faith. Faith is the key. The moment that you believe, the moment you put your faith in Christ, you already have eternal life. And that is the most important thing that you could ever possess. Folks, this, this life on earth, this time we spend here on this planet, it is, it is nothing. It is a it is the, 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 the span of time, just a blink of an eye. It is nothing compared to the eternal stretches that lay before us in eternity in heaven. And so many people spend so much time focusing on the stuff of this life, which is going to pass away, which is just, uh, it's just a speck. It's a, it's a minute time compared to eternity. And they spend no time thinking about what is absolutely important about eternity in heaven and getting that right and getting that set. I read uh, recently, back in 2001, uh, the Boeing Corporation decided to restore uh, the very last Boeing 307 Stratoliner airplane. Now that was an important airplane because even though it was driven by propellers, it was the very first airplane to be pressurized. And because it was pressurized, it could fly above 20,000 feet and it could actually fly over storm systems. So it provided a smoother travel for people. And it was the very first pressurized airliner. And so they decided they were going to restore it. And in order to restore this thing, they went to incredible lengths to get this thing exactly 
perfect, pristine condition. They actually got a company in New York to pull out a, an antique loom in order to make the, uh, the wall coverings, the, the cloth wall coverings that were inside this thing. Uh, they, they spared no expense putting in the identical flooring that was supposed to be in this thing. Uh, all of the, the seats, everything were, were uh, meticulously uh, repaired and replaced. They actually imp uh, imported Spanish leather to reupholster all the seats on the entire airplane. It was in perfect, pristine condition. And then they decided they were going to send it out on a, a goodwill tour. It was going to be a kind of a publicity tour. So it was going to fly actually all over the world. And, and they were going to display this thing all over the world. So they, they sent it out. And uh, about six months into this tour, it crashed into San Francisco Bay and sunk. Well, some people might think, well, maybe it was because of these ancient engines it was running. No, the engines were in pristine condition. They had restored those. Well, maybe the control surfaces didn't work. No, everything of that had been taken care of perfectly. The reason it crashed was because the flight crew, who had been used to flying jetliners that had a much longer range, forgot to refuel it. They forgot to put gas in the airplane. Now, folks, there are so many people who are just like that. They focus on all the, the minute details of this life. They get so caught up in making sure that they can make a living, that they can collect wealth, that they can retire well, that they can uh, have power and prestige and look good and feel good and, and be admired by folks. And they focus on all the details and they work so hard and they forget about the most important thing, not just making a living, but making life, having a life, having eternal life. That's the most important thing. Nothing else is important as getting your relationship right with Jesus Christ so that you have heaven and eternal life. All the rest of it, all the other details, they're nice, but they're not essential. Eternal life is. We need to make sure that we have eternal life. Don't forget the most important thing this morning. Jesus Christ came to bring life. Eternal life spiritual life. But just as important as the fact that Christ came to bring life, to, to bring us eternal life, Jesus Christ also has the power to judge and condemn. Look at verse 22. For the Father judges no one, but has committed all judgment to the Son. It will be Christ who sits on the throne at judgment day. The Bible says that every one of us is going to have to stand before Christ. And we will stand before him either as our Savior, who will give us rewards for our service, or we will stand before him as our judge, who will condemn us for all eternity. Verse 27. And has given him authority to execute judgment also, because he is the Son of Man. Do not marvel at this, for the hour is coming in which all who are in the graves will hear his voice and come forth. Those who have done good to the resurrection of life. And when it says done good, it's not talking about the fact that you did religious things, or that you, you did things that people approve of, that you're morally good. When it's talking about doing good, it's talking about putting your faith in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Those who have done good to the resurrection of life and those who have done evil, those who have rejected Christ, to the resurrection of condemnation. So much for those who, who believe in, that bad people are just annihilated. You talk to some of your Jehovah's Witness friends and they'll say, well, there is no hell, just bad people are just annihilated, they just disappear. That's not what the Bible teaches. Clark Pinnock was a theologian, an evangelical theologian, wrote many, uh, many very good books. And then his son, who was not a believer in Christ, in fact, he was, he was antagonistic towards the gospel and towards Christianity. His son was killed in a car accident. And he knew his son had rejected Christ. He knew his son hated uh, God. He hated everything about, about the Bible, about Christ, about uh, Scripture, about Christians. He hated, he, he, he was lost when he died. And Clark Pinnock said, 
he had always taught the truth of the scriptures. But he could not face the fact that his son had died and gone to hell. And so he decided for that reason to reject hell. To reject the idea of hell. The only problem he had with that, though, was that every time he, he, he began to look at the Scriptures, he couldn't deny the fact the Bible teaches there is a hell. So in the end, in order to reject hell, he had to reject the whole Bible. He had to reject the Scriptures. The Scriptures are very clear, folks. Revelation 14, 11. Speaking of hell, he says, And the smoke of their torment ascends forever and ever, and they have no rest day or night. Your soul was made for eternity. Your soul will exist forever in one place or another. Either in heaven with Jesus Christ or condemned forever in a place called hell. You will exist consciously forever in one place or another. Your soul does not disappear. Your soul was made for eternity. I read an article this week. Apparently there is a, a rise, there's been an increase in the number of people committing suicide in national parks. It's kind of odd, isn't it? The number of suicides in national parks has soared. And, and they say the reason for that is because there are so many people out there who have become uh, sort of uh, such radical environmentalists that they really kind of worship nature as their God. And, and this article talked about one man, he was 65 years old, he, was a, he actually uh, uh, taught biology in, in, in a university, and uh, he, he decided life hadn't become worth, was no longer worth living, and he went to a uh, national park in Utah and committed suicide, and he left a note, and in this note he said that he was returning his body and soul to nature. Folks, Jesus, when he died on the cross, he said, I commit my spirit to the Father. You, 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 folks, nature is not eternal. Do you know that? The Bible says that the, the heaven and earth will pass away. That this, this world is going to pass away. There's going to be a new heaven and a new earth. This world that surrounds us is not eternal, but your soul is. Your soul will live forever in one place or another, either in heaven or in hell. And you make the choice. You decide which place you are going to be for all eternity. And folks, when you make that choice, once you die... Once, once you stand before the Lord, Christ's judgment on you is going to be final. There's no place to appeal. Look at verse 30. He says, I can of myself do nothing as I hear I judge, and my judgment is righteous because I do not seek my own will, but the will of the Father who sent me. It, what he's saying here, as I said before, is that Christ's will is the Father's will, and the Father's will is the Spirit's will. So when Christ passes judgment, when, when you breathe your last and you stand before the Lord God and he passes judgment and he condemns you and he says, depart from me for I never knew you, there's nowhere to appeal. There's nowhere to go. Well, I could appeal to the Father. No, the Father has the same will as the Son. Well, I'll appeal to the Spirit. The Spirit has the same will as the Father. They share the same will. There's nowhere to appeal. There's no second chance. I know some people will try to teach you that, well, well if you, once you die, that, that you know, God will give you another chance. Surely he's going to give people another chance. The Bible does not teach that. It says, is it appointed to a man once to die and then the judgment? There's nowhere to appeal. There's no second chance. This is it. This life is all you have to make the choice. Am I going to stand in heaven with Christ as my Savior or stand before Him and be condemned to hell for eternity? And I, I talk to people that say, Oh, I, I just I can't believe that. I just reject this idea of judgment. I reject this idea of hell. I cannot believe that a loving God would send someone to hell. Well, first of all, let me just point out, God doesn't decide you do. When you reject him, 
When you reject him, you have decided consciously, I don't want any part of heaven. So it's your choice. But if God is love, if God is good, if God is love, he must also be a God of wrath. There must be a place called hell if God is love. I read recently about a, a Christian theologian from Croatia. His name was Miroslav Volf. And Miroslav Volf wrote this. He said, man, uh, for years, he said, I rejected the idea of an angry God who would send people to hell. I rejected the idea of God's wrath. He said it was barbaric. It was unworthy of a God of love. And then the war in Croatia broke out. And he saw what happened in that war. 200,000 people were killed. Three million people were displaced. Whole villages, cities were destroyed. People were shelled day in and day out. Men, women, and children died. He said, I saw the barbaric acts of vicious men. He said, and then I looked around the world and, and I saw other things like in Rwanda where in the span of a hundred days, 800,000 people were murdered, butchered by violent men. He said, and I looked at that and I had to ask myself, if God is love, how does he feel about that? Is he going to go to these barbaric, wicked, hateful men and tap, tap them on the head and say, oh, it's okay, it's all right, just come on into heaven? He said, no, if God is love, he hates what they did. He hates what they have done. And he will pour out his wrath on wickedness and evil and sin in this world. He's right. He's right. Because our God is a God of love. He will pour out wrath on sin and evil and wickedness. And it is our choice, folks, our choice whether we stand before Him as our Savior or as our judge. God is love, but God is also just. That's why Moses called on the people of Israel in Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse 19. He said, I call heaven and earth as witnesses today against you that I have set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Therefore, choose life that both you and your descendants may live. The Bible is full of calls to people to choose. Choose you this day who you will serve. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. The Bible calls on us over and over. Choose. Choose. Will you serve Jesus Christ and stand before him one day as your Savior? Or will you reject him and stand before him one day condemned and experience his wrath and judgment? The choice is ours. And I said it before you today as Moses said it before the people of God so long ago. Choose you this day who you'll serve. Choose blessing or cursing. Choose life or choose death. But today is the day. Today's the day to choose. In just a moment, we're going to sing a hymn of invitation. I'm going to be down here at the front. If you want to know Christ as your personal Savior, you, you recognize that you need Jesus. You need to choose life. I'm going to invite you to step out and lie on the first verse of that hymn. Cut the front and say, Pastor, I want to know this Jesus. I want to know how I can have heaven and eternal life. Because the Bible says you can know. You can know. You can be certain. These things are written that you might know that you have heaven and eternal life. God can, can place a certainty in your heart that you have eternal life. So that you know that if you walk out of this, this, uh, this building, you walk out that door, and, and you were to die in a car crash on the way home, you know where you would spend eternity. During this time of invitation, let's get that straight. Let's make sure that nobody leaves this place unsure where they stand before Jesus. Maybe here you know Christ is your Lord and your Savior. You've got this straight. You, you, you settled your eternal destination. But you need a church home, a place where people will love you and care about you, a place where, where the gospel is preached and proclaimed and taught. I'm going to invite you to bring your family and be a part of, of uh, Eastside Baptist Church. I'll be at the front. Once again, we'll receive you as a Baptist church receives members during this time of invitation. You can come forward. Well, let's be obedient to God's call in our lives. Let's pray. 
Heavenly Father, we thank you that you have sent your Son, Jesus Christ, and that Christ himself is, in fact, fully God. Lord, we ask that no person would leave this place unsure of their eternal destination, that they would recognize that Jesus Christ is God and he is our Savior. They would recognize that he has the power of life, spiritual life, eternal life, and they would receive that life. And the Heavenly Father, no one would leave this place under the judgment, the wrath, the condemnation of their sins. In Jesus' name,